All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining the Data Farber Cancer Institute Data Science Zoominar. Today, we are very fortunate to have David Van Kesser from Emory Biostat. He is uh, gonna talk to and answer some questions about all these vaccine information that we're hearing about. We're gonna get into the, some of the basics, but also we might ask some detailed questions about the statistics and the logistics of, of data management and all that stuff that we like to talk about. So David is an assistant professor in Biostat at Emory. His research focuses on theory applications of machine learning and causal inference. And his specific area of interest includes competing risks, complex longitudinal data, and theory of robust non-parametric statistical inference. And a couple of those, you can see why his, one of his areas of application is in, um, in vaccine and, and, and um, and epidemiology. So today, vaccine trials and epidemiology. So today we're gonna be asking him all about the, the vaccine trials, how they started, how they went and what it means now, what are we gonna do now in, in prioritizing people and all that. So thanks David for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so let's get started right away. I know a lot of people are, are, cute, are um, eager to hear about this. So the first question I, I wanna ask about is before the trials, how, how does this all, how does the basic research happen here? Uh, and I, I know, I think most of our audience has a pretty good idea of, of immunology and how that all works. And, and that this is a special vaccine that that's uses RNA and it's, it's somewhat novel, but we kind of get all that. But I'm, I'm more interested in like how like Pfizer connects with BioNTech and who actually develops it who like what what does each part do and then there's moderna and then there's oxford astrazeneca i imagine there's others so this like i guess is a kind of a general question asking about how this all gets how do all these groups come together and what do they actually do to produce a vaccine yeah it's that's a good question um I, and you know everybody's got to take with a grain of salt that i'm a statistician and we'll be giving sort of the statistician's understanding of all of these uh, question. So, uh, I, I mean, I think it, it sort of varies by manufacturer and producer in terms of what the specific arrangement is. Um, you know, Pfizer and Bio, BioNTech, I believe it's pronounced, um, you know, BioNTech's doing the manufacturing, at least the small scale manufacturing for the trials, whereas Pfizer is sort of handling the regulatory aspects of submission. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. And and so for Moderna, for example, you know, the relatively small startup when this all began you know now they're worth let's just say i wish i had invested a lot more money in moderna last spring but uh, <laughs> in any case you know th th they were relatively inexperienced sort of um bringing a product to market and so they were a company that really engaged very closely with operation warp speed and and got a lot of government guidance in terms of how to actually navigate the regulatory submission process uh, i see but they developed the, the vaccine independently that's right yeah uh, you know, I, man, I, I'm not sure if that was with funding in partnership with with NIAID or anything like that. I, I, I don't know the specific arrangement. Yeah, but it's it's their intellectual property. So that's for sure. oh, interesting. OK. And then Oxford, of course, was the developer of their vaccine, whereas AstraZeneca said they're going to basically handle the manufacturing and regulatory submission. I see. Um, and so it, I, I think in the second wave, it'll mostly be more sort of straightforward pharmaceutical companies that are, you know, kind of handling everything end to end. But the, yeah, these, sure. these first few kind of had interesting partnerships between tech, government, and, and academia. Interesting. So in our department, we are, are very familiar with how complicated a, a clinical trial can be. But for those that don't, the, the, so there's a manufacturing. So, so David talked about the manufacturing, and then he said the, the regulatory element, that is just getting it approved is very, very it's a lot of work, a lot of logistics and pharmaceuticals, as well as, as institutes like ours, like Dana-Farber, uh, MD Anderson, MSK, these kind of institutions have experience doing this and they have people in place that know all the different things you have to do and how to, how, what to submit. And it's, so that's why, that's why the, Pfizer is involved in, the, in this particular one of BioNTech and AstraZeneca is, is involved in Oxford. In, that's okay, right, good. Yeah. Excellent, okay. So now tell us a little bit about once once, um, let's say, BioNTech has the, the, the vaccine ready, then 
what happens in phase one? Then Pfizer takes over, and what's what is what is happening in phase one? So just to let everybody uh, be be aware, there's three phases in in every clinical trial before it gets approved, and in the first, the, they they get progressively harder uh, to pass the test because you're check you're checking for safety and and efficacy. But so tell yeah. us what is the phase one? What happens there? Yeah. So. What's typically done in phase one would just be a small immunogenicity study, right? So we've sort of identified the right antigen, you know, the, the right way to make a vaccine. We have an idea of the immune response that we're going after. Generally, first looking at antibodies, antibodies binding antibodies. Uh, and in phase one, we're basically doing dose finding and checking uh, basic safety, right? Um, on on animals. Like Usually, no. Uh, it, it can be in humans as well. Can I think you know you'll you'll see animal challenge trials happening maybe early on when you're interested in identifying, uh, you know, the right assay uh, for the antibodies. Uh, but phase one will typically involve a small number of human participants, and really looking in this case for for uh, COVID nineteen vaccines, kind of comparing the level of antibody responses. Uh, induced by the vaccine to those isolated from convalescent serum. So basically blood samples from previously infected and recovered participants and really trying to align the dose with one that gives you a similar level of antibodies um, as, as a natural infection would or even slightly more antibody response. And of course, making sure that that dose is tolerable in small human populations. And then typically, right, and in, in, in a non-pandemic setting, we would move to phase two, which would be a smaller efficacy trial where you would maybe go for a, a very high risk population, you know, an HIV vaccine trials. This is where we're really doing trials in, um, you know, sex workers, intravenous drug users, people at very high risk for HIV. And it's a, it's a smaller scale study. Um, and, you know, you're doing that so that you accrue events fast enough that you can learn if, if there's some efficacy signal before you advance to phase three. But here in the pandemic setting, right, everything's very compressed, right? So sort of the phase two, three kind of all got rolled into one where it was kind and, of and that's fda saying okay go ahead and do it what what changes what changed now versus uh, normal times yeah i think partially you know regulators guidance to companies but also certainly uh, you know operation warp speed and similar programs um, because you have to think about sort of the the manufacturing that's required to, you know, get enough doses to run a 30,000, 40,000 person trial. It's non-trivial. It's, it's a big investment on the part of the companies. And so one of the big things that uh, OWS has done is basically take on that risk by, you know, pre-committing to buying a certain number of doses before even efficacy has been signaled. So tell us what, tell everybody what Operation Warp Speed is. I forgot to ask that. Yeah. So it's a, uh, it's a U.S. government initiative between NIH and Department of Defense. And it's basically, the way I think about it, I mean, it's, it's a, a whole suite of, you know, anything you've heard about COVID vaccine development involving the government and distribution all falls under this OWS umbrella. Um, but I think in the way that OWS engages with companies, there's really two ways you can, uh, there's these purchase orders, right, where basically the government says, we're going to purchase 10 million, 20 million, whatever it is, doses from you. Um, and that, you know, gives the companies the capital up front, shifts the risk from the companies to the government, basically, and allows the manufacturers to start manufacturing at scale while these phase three trials are going on. And that's really what allowed us to say, you know, that a week after, um, you know, the Pfizer vaccine is approved, we're already shipping millions of these doses out. And so that, you know, that, that distribution so it, is also falling under OWS as well, but right. that's sort of the, the DOD side of things. So basically it's that the government is more, much, much more involved than usual uh, in the, in the yeah, in so, so process. Certainly in the purchasing. And so it's, you know, of the main vaccines you've heard about in the U S Pfizer is sort of the weird one. And that the only way they engaged OWS was through this purchasing agreement and through the distribution. All the other companies have additionally engaged in basically saying they'll let NIH fund their trial through BARDA. So it's an arm of NIH that handles these sort of um, private public contracts. And so all of those companies, that's Moderna, that's Sanofi, Novavax, Janssen, um, and I'm missing the, the, the last, AstraZeneca, of course. 
Um, all of those companies basically have a certain level of government oversight in the design and conduct of their trials. And, and what does the government get in return for that? Well, um, we get a, a, a bit more say in the data that's generated from the trials. So in particular, sort of, you know, FDA has, has told the companies what they want to see in order to issue licensure. Um, but the government, you know, we may want to see a little bit more, right? Because the government's going to need to make purchasing decisions down the line. It's going to have to choose between these companies. Um, and so they were able to ask trials basically to ensure recruitment of key uh, target populations, older adults, uh, racial ethnic minorities, to target high risk populations in order to generate enough data on severe COVID cases as opposed to just mild symptomatic ones. Uh, and it, it, it gives a little more, well, in normal times, I might say a little bit more credibility, right? That there's sort of a government sponsor, though in 2020, maybe that that, that worked us worked against us in, in some sense. <laughs> well, maybe not, maybe not. I mean, still, uh, FDA has a, a, a track record of of approving safe drugs. Uh, yeah. For the I don't know, right, it's like it's, uh, they they get criticized for the opposite. <laughs> for being too too restrictive, I think. That's right. Then, That's right. Yeah. And that, you know, that was a big criticism, I think, or coming into these studies was was the, the worry that FDA was going to ask for too much and, hey, we're in the middle of a pandemic can we loosen the bar a little bit. And to their credit, I, they, they, they didn't really move the bar very much. Yeah, great. So um, in phase three, that's where the big clinical trial happens. And I, I know that for Pfizer, there were about over 40,000 volunteers. Uh, these are these are healthy volunteers, no? Like, well, how do they pick these exactly? Yeah, well, it ties into who you're hoping to get an indication for, right? Because it's a regulatory trial. And so FDA is going to be very hesitant to say it's okay for any type of individual to be vaccinated who wasn't included in the trial. Um, and so that, you know, in the, the context of COVID, there's some interesting groups, right? People who have been previously infected, being, being one group, pregnant women, children. Um, and so those were the really the tricky ones, but sort of everyone else was, was still wanting to be targeted, right? We want a broad indication. Um, mm -hmm. And so how do they recruit them? It's, uh, you know, these, these are large multi-center, multinational trials. And so it's sort of a you know, regional specific thing. As far as I can tell, it's, it's sort of study sites are responsible for recruiting their own participants. You know, they're given guidelines. We we're really looking for older adults. We're looking for prioritizing racial ethnic minorities and so forth. But beyond that, they're sort of free to recruit participants in any means that they see fit. Interesting. So they, so they're doing, I just, I want to like, listen a little bit about the details. Like they, they go to different hospitals and say, hey, do you want to help us and, you know, get volunteers, however it is that you get them and, and we'll, we'll include you? That's that's generally how it works. Or is there a, already a set group of places that are that yeah. are ready to go? Yeah. So so I can talk about OWS trials and Pfizer, you know, is the oddball. So I, I really don't know a lot about that. But for OWS, um, basically, NIAD formed a new clinical trials network out of existing clinical trials networks. So it took some of the HIV uh, prevention and vaccine trials networks of so the HVTN, the vaccine trials network, the HPTN prevention trials network, the ACPG, which is up there in Boston housed and, and one other network uh, and basically com combined these into the, the COVID-19 prevention network. And so this is a network of like labs and study sites who have done vaccine trials before in the past, who have done large scale clinical trials. Um, and, and those form the core of sort of the study sites for many of the OWS trials. And so some of the sponsors bring their own sites, particularly international sites uh, that get added on as well. Uh, but there is a sort of core domestic sites that, that are formed from this CoVPN. So we got a couple of questions out. I'm going to ask them right now. So as you said, children were not included in the initial clinical trial. This is from Anita, one of our department members. Um, she asked, could you comment on the design of any auxiliary trial to test the safety and efficacy in children? Yeah, so you know, Pfizer has ongoing trials, as far as I know, going down to age 12, I believe. 
um, for safety and efficacy. I was just on a call this morning where, you know, there's a push for Moderna and, and AstraZeneca and others to really start engaging in, in more pediatric research. Um, it's, it's been tough. I think sort of before, I think it's going to be tough before a full formal BLA is, is granted to really see large scale trials in children. Um, and, you know, the, then everybody's sort of hoping, I think that we can establish an immune correlate, which I can talk more about, but basically a valid surrogate endpoint for these clinical trials that'll make bridging efficacy into pediatric populations a little more straightforward so that you have to, you know, you don't have to do a 30,000 kid trial. You can, you know, do maybe half that or a third of that, whatever you need to get good safety data, basically. Just safety. Yeah. So that, that relates to, our, to a second question from Meredith Reagan, also from our department. She would love to hear about the choice of endpoints. Uh, wait, sorry. And the various analysis populations requiring two doses plus 14 days for primary. Right, right. Um, so choice of endpoints. Yeah, that's that was that was a big point of discussion, you know, um, throughout this whole process. I think uh, it happened very early on with WHO and so forth, where we sort of settled on symptomatic disease being the least bad endpoint to try to stipulate as a primary. Um, least bad meaning it's good in the sense that you'll you'll be able to see enough of these events to have a well-powered trial to be able to tell that these vaccines work, but also questionable because you know there could be many sort of moderate cases uh, of COVID and, and really it's a question of is that the most clinically relevant uh, endpoint. And so, so sorry it wasn't based on testing? It was based on actually getting. It's, it's both the primary analysis. Symptoms are, and a. Okay. Symptoms and a positive test. Yep. So okay. it's a PCR confirmed with, you know, you meet two of this list of symptoms. Uh, I see. I see. And um, though, though Janssen has, so that's Johnson and Johnson, Janssen's their vaccine arm, they've, they've stipulated that they're actually looking at more severe, moderate to severe endpoints as their primary. And, and so FDA has basically said, we also want data on more severe endpoints, but you don't necessarily have to power your trial to generate those data. Um, so we have a nice paper that came out in um, Annals of Internal Medicine. Uh, Devin Mayrorta is the, the, the first author on that. And that sort of outlines what the, the definition for each sort of endpoint you might consider are, what the challenges associated with are. That's a good read. Was there, the second part of that question was the two dose versus I assume one dose. Yeah, the various analysis populations requiring two doses plus 14 days for primary. Yeah, so that's, it's sort of a weird thing in the vaccine world is basically in these regulatory trials, how they work is, uh, you know, the, the clock starts in a way we start counting cases for the primary analysis starting two weeks after the last dose of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And sort of all of these cases that happen between dose one and that time point are kind of discarded for the primary analysis, which of course makes statisticians feel a little uncomfortable. It makes me feel a little uncomfortable, but, but you know, I, I live with it. Um, <laughs> but the idea there is why is that time point selected? It's, it's basically, you're trying to isolate a, a, a biological efficacy basically. And you're trying to give the vaccine the best chance it has to work with the idea that it's gonna take a couple weeks after receipt of a dose to really get your immune system primed to generate the peak antibody levels. And so that's that's the the reasoning for doing that. And of course, then we ask for secondary analyses, right, where we start the clock at day one, and we still see that that things look okay there. And sort of the intriguing thing that I think this question is alluding to, right, is this little small blip of efficacy, right, that we could see after dose one pretty clearly for both Pfizer and Moderna. Mm -hmm. And you know that was. I, I don't know if surprising is the word. I don't think we knew what to expect really. So, so sort of how that thought process went was we start with these dose finding trials, right? And what we saw in the dose finding trials is that um, if you just gave one dose and checked antibody levels, they were considerably lower than those seen in convalescent serum. Mm -hmm. And so that, that whereas two doses really gave you as good or better antibody responses. And so that was sort of the time when they said, we wanna, you know, we got one shot to get this right. Let's go for the two dose regimen. And, you know, now, of course, we want to ask questions like, well, what if we only gave one dose? And I think that's, a, you know, an, an extremely important 
question to ask. I don't know if I see a way forward for it to be evaluated practically, though, given where we're at. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, if we can if we can figure out a way to do that. Yeah, definitely. So once you once this the trial, let me uh, maybe you don't know because this is a Pfizer. I'm particularly interested in Pfizer. So so when I get asked, uh, I get questions from non scientists about how do you know these things are safe, and I try to do my best at answering them when I can. Um, one of the questions that, that are hard to, to answer is if Pfizer is is the one that are that are handling the data and and deciding if it's safe, how can we trust them, right? Don't they have a interest in in lying about its safety? So can you say a little bit about those? Because I know it's it's I mean the answer to that is the FDA is on top of this. Like right. it's all over the it's a lot of regulations. It's it would be really, really hard to cheat. Right. Uh, how, but can you describe that in like details of that like what actually happens like they 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 follow these people and they're, they're being followed in different centers right so, it's, so Pfizer would have to control all these independent places to, to to do this for them but then these data go into some database somewhere so how does that all uh, how do we make sure that's all like uh trustworthy yeah yeah I mean it, it comes down to to trusting the FDA um and you know the FDA has the ability to audit basically any part of this process from the manufacturing to the way the data are collected to the way that, that the study investigators communicate with monitoring boards, right? They, they are basically present in all aspects of the, the trial. And, you know, the FDA is, I, I would say their credibility is essentially unassailable though this year, right? We saw that people really we're calling that into question, given whether there was sort of political influence at the FDA. I think we've come out of that sort of with the FDA intact, their, their integrity. But, you know, I, I would point out like one of my best friends from grad school is an FDA statistician. Yeah, I know. And, and we know a lot of people in that. We know a lot of them. And so if you know people that work there, right? I mean, they're like the stodgiest people you can yeah. imagine, and right? They, and they, they drive, they drive Corollas. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. They're, they're, they're not, they're not taking perks from pharma. And I mean, it's, it's not just pharma, right? Like I, I wanted to invite him down to give a seminar and he like literally can't have us bring him down for a seminar because it's seen as a conflict of interest. If I visit him, yeah, with yeah, you can't, can't buy them lunch. Buy him a cup of coffee. Yeah. Forget mm -hmm. it. You can't do it. So it's, um, you know, it, it really is the FDA, but beyond that, I also like to, you know, remind people about the role that the DSMB plays in the conduct of the trial. And so, so for people who haven't been involved in the clinical trials, the DSMB is a data safety monitoring board. It's an independent board of, of experts, clinical experts, statisticians, ethicists, right, who are, who are there to oversee the conduct of the trial and make recommendations uh, to the sponsor about whether the trial should continue or whether enough evidence is accrued uh, to stop the trial or whether there's safety issues. And if you sit in on these meetings, I mean, it, this, this, it's, it's 90% about safety and the safety details that are presented to the trial monitoring board are extremely detailed and they are reported extremely quickly. Uh, so, you know, if, if there's a serious adverse event that gets reported to DSMB within a couple days, they call a meeting uh, and as needed, it goes from there. And, and so if you sat on one of these, these meetings or even indeed on the FDA open session for VRPAC, you see that there is really extremely thorough reporting of safety data. And, it, and, and indeed, it's in the sponsor's interest, right? I mean, you know, you're not going to make money off a vaccine just because you bring it to market. You're going to make money off the vaccine because people trust that it's safe and effective. And so, you know, it's not in their interest, I don't think, to cut corners, particularly in a case like this where, you know, the spotlight is really shining on them. Right. Right, right. So so at the end, this board, they actually can, they, they can see all the data it's they have access to it so they could you know they can they can make the calculations and that's right that's right they're they're supplied unblinded data to confirm the company's calculations to do their own analyses so let, let's talk about this calculation so at the end of the day what, what was reported and made the news and all that is the um the e efficacy rate right which is one divide one minus the cases in the uh in the in the treatment arm divided by the cases in the control arm at multiplied by 100 that is is that a standard I, that's actually one of the questions from sihan way um yeah. is that the standard for always is that always defined that way 
Yeah, yeah, I don't know yeah. why. I think uh, that's Halloran and Ira Longini wrote a book on it in the '90s, and since then, that's that's been the same. So I always say it's it's like it's like a one minus a risk ratio, right? So one yeah. minus the risk in the vaccine divided by risk in placebo. But if you look closely, right, risk actually can be defined in a number of different ways, right? Some just will report it as proportion of vaccinated, some report as an incidence rate, some as a hazard. And so there are some subtleties actually in sort of how you quantify this. Um, and it was initially very stressful for me as a statistician looking at multiple protocols, seeing it defined with different estimates essentially. But in a rare event setting, you can pretty quickly convince yourself that they're all basically the same. Um, and, and so it's not really something that we have to think too hard about. Um, in, in, in some other vaccine context, it matters a lot. I think if you're looking at a hazard-based one, estimate versus a cumulative-based estimate, you can start to get in some kind of important differences. But here, it, it, it's kind of, you can just think about it as a, a relative reduction in risk. Right. And the, it, is, it was reported as 95%, I think, for Pfizer. And for Moderna, it was also up there. But then one, one of the things that a lot of statisticians complain about, uh, or not really complain, but they kind of grumbled about the fact that there was no standard error. <laughs> yeah. In. I mean, it's not like at that high, when it's that high, it's that's what it what was going to be like 80 to 85 to, not, to 100 or something like that. Uh, what is are there? This, does that get discussed in, 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 in these meetings where like, how do, should we tell the press? Should we even bother with a confidence interval? We just kill the number and yeah, no, I would love to understand how that process works a little better, right? Because sort of uniformly people were, have, have been upset at the way these data have been released. Um, some companies I think have done it better than others. I think, you know, Moderna probably gave the most detailed press release, but I don't think they even put a confidence interval in there. You know, I joined Twitter this year and the most popular thing I've ever done on Twitter is just put confidence intervals on the numbers that have been reported in this press All release. right. What, what was I? Was it, it what? What was it? Was like a what? I, I just yeah, I guess I, eighty-five to a hundred. But what? high eighties is a lower bound. Yeah. All right. Good. So it's. I mean, it's it's robust. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's not bad. Okay, great. So let's see. So we have we have a bunch of questions, and I'm now I'm getting lost. All right. So I'll get to these in a second. Let me let them because because I have something similar in my questions. So, um, one quick thing I want you to clarify just because I get asked this a lot and I, I know the answer but I want to hear from you too that there's a difference between a between approval and emergency use authorization and what we have now is not approval it's emergency use authorization which means we can't force our employees for example to take it uh, like we force people to take the flu which seen it at Farber but we can't force them to take this one so can you really quickly tell us the difference yeah so uh, right an EUA emergency use authorization is really, um, it's a temporary grant. It's not, it's not approval by the FDA, but it's basically saying the FDA is allowing people to distribute a, a medical product. And, uh, you know, you sent this question and I was kind of looking at the history of you guys and I, I learned that it was something that was created in response to basically 9-11 mm. in response to bioterrorism threats or nuclear warfare threats that basically we needed a process whereby we could get um, medical products out to the population quickly. And so the language around EUAs is really that it requires something of that magnitude, right? There has to be a risk to national security. There has to be no other available product. And you have to have at least enough data to say that basically the benefits reasonably outweigh the risk. Um, and, and if so, then the FDA will basically allow you to distribute the product. You can't market it. Uh, so you can't do all the things that you can do under um, the full approval. Right, but you can get it, start getting it out to people. So, um, what's missing for the approval, exactly? I think more safety data is basically. What, data. I mean, that's that's all they're going to get, basically. I mean, because because so many people are are now, you know, receiving. A lot of these trials are healthcare workers, right? And these healthcare workers are now crossing over to research, receive vaccines. So you're starting to lose the ability to maintain a placebo control in these trials. Um, and, and we can talk about that as a whole other issue, but but I think really what the FDA is looking for is, is longer term safety data. You know, there will, there will be some more efficacy data generated. Like I know Moderna has gone from 190 events to now over 400 something events. Mm -hmm. So they'll get a little bit more efficacy data, but I, I'd say safety is the yeah. Okay. So, but from everything we've seen, it seems quite safe. I mean, not nothing different than 
other vaccines we take. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, there's it's maybe a little more reactogenic than, than your average flu shot, but for the most part, things are short lived. You know, there's going to be things that crop up, right? Like the, the allergic reactions that we're starting to see now, but nothing serious has, has come up. And what I like to remind people is that we have, you know, very robust vaccine surveillance systems in place to, to identify these things. And, and what we see now is that basically, if there's, you know, if there's bad side effects, they at least happen very, very rarely. And the bottom line is, you know, that'll be the case with any drug is it's going to take millions of people getting it before you really start to identify those rare safety events. So before I forget, Amin Shaky wants you to provide a link to that paper you referred to. When you get sure. a chance, you I'll, can put uh, it take, in the either ch chat or Q&A and then tell us where. Probably the chat's better and then everybody can go look. Sure. So a question from Nitesh Turaga. How is... How is it that only some countries are getting the Pfizer vaccine in like the UK and not others more seriously hurt countries by the pandemic? What role does the OWS, the OWS play in this? Yeah, well, I, I wish I sort of had better answers about this. Um, my limited understanding is that, you know, OWS has purchased, you know, the US government has purchased a certain number of doses from Pfizer and from Moderna and from all these big companies. Um, and are distributing those according, you know, distributing them to the states and the states are distributing them according to their own guidelines um, with the CDC kind of recommending, making, making recommendations for the states. Um, they bought it before it was, way before it was approved. Or, yeah, I mean, these purchase agreements were in, over the summer. Or and other countries could have done that. I, I they, assume so, right? yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so what I don't know, what I don't have a good answer for is to what extent so sort of people like Bill Gates and his foundations have been involved in, in initial purchase orders, because I think those are the, the organizations you're probably going to see, uh, you know, purchase orders for the developing world going into. But uh, another answer to that question, so that the papers in the chat, everybody, uh, another answer, another reason for this is that other countries don't trust the FDA. They have they have their own, uh, they have their own regulatory organizations that might not have approved it yet uh, i know that, that that the uk for example approved it what a week before the us yeah uh, and there was another country a small country that approved it before but then the rest are i guess will be we'll hear from them soon i assume europe will will, will approve it soon or maybe already yeah, I think did i saw europe did maybe today did, yeah. i don't remember if that was pfizer or moderna but i saw something yeah. that reminds today Right. And then the UK is not, is UK is not part of you. Is that Brexit? Is that why they are outside or they've always been outside? I'm not sure. How. Yeah, me neither. I don't, I got to look into that one. All right. So yeah, that's, that's, um, yeah, that's an interesting thing. Like that you, do you, and do you have an idea of how Pfizer sets a price for, for the vaccine? No. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. I think I, you know, it's a, it's probably a balancing act for them, right? Cause they don't want to be seen as, totally evil and profiting mm -hmm. on suffering, but you know, they do want to make a profit, I'm sure. Or at least break even. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting, you know, because I, I know AstraZeneca has basically said they don't, they, they won't make a profit off their vaccine. They've committed to that. Yeah. But, but just so everybody understands, even if they don't make, it's still gonna, they still have to cover costs. So it's not it's still gonna right. cost something. That's right. That's right. But yeah, I mean, don't, that's, I mean, don't tell AstraZeneca shareholders or, you know that they've, they've publicly said that yeah so it's 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 been a wild a wild ride i think in terms of you know the stock market versus the reality of, of how much money might actually be made off these products all right well we have about 10 minutes left um and too many questions to ask so i'm going to ask maybe one or two more and then i'm going to ask the last one about some of the controversy maybe i don't know if controversy might to be too strong a word about uh how we're prioritizing yeah. who gets the vaccine so here's a question from andy she uh oh yeah going back to the confidence interval part the pfizer study as published in the new england journal used a bayesian credible interval can you comment on this particular design choice instead of using a frequentist approach yeah yeah that was um sort of interesting that um I mean, number one, that that I, if, if anyone's paying attention this summer, there was sort of a huge push to get these protocols released. 
to be public, which is not sort of due course. Companies see that as intellectual property and don't want to put it out, but they did to their credit. And then the first uh, thing. Yeah, that caught my attention. I've never seen that before. Maybe it's happened before, but that's the first. Yeah, time it was, it was surprising. It was surprising. Um, but then the first thing that happened, right, is Pfizer released their protocol and everyone saw that there was this Bayesian, you know, uh, Bayesian design with a pretty aggressive interim monitoring plan. And the question was like, oh, are they trying to cheat basically? Um, so one of the things I did, and you can go to my GitHub and see it on there is basically say, okay, well, what if they didn't do a Bayesian analysis? Mm -hmm. What if they did a more standard frequentist approach? And the operating characteristics are very similar. It's basically, it ends up being, if you're a clinical trials person, it ends up being like if you did a standard frequentist design with Pocock style monitoring, you get the same operating characteristics as their trial, basically. So why, why did they do it as Bayesian? I don't know, probably their study statisticians Bayesian and wanted it to do that way. But sort of, you can, you can, you can kind of tell from their protocol that they basically did a Bayesian analysis, but you know, they, they wanted some specific frequentist operating characteristics. So, I think, uh -huh. you know, they I basically see. picked a prior that gave them the, the frequentist characteristics that FDA wanted to see. So, Interesting. I know. I mean, FDA now uses a Bayesian approaches often. It's not that rare anymore. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't mind it personally because it's, I think, the way that people sort of want to interpret the data anyway. You know, I, that feels a little, it breaks my heart as a devoted frequentist to say that. But yeah, but we're getting tired of correcting people when they say confidence in the world, when they define it wrong, right? It's like, yeah, sure, go ahead. It's the probability of it being <laughs> so much easier to, to, to not having to correct people. Yeah. So, um, all right, so now let's talk about distribution. So we already have a, an anonymous attendee asking, how is the vaccine distribution decided across states? Fairness, federal decision, any role of data and analysis supporting these decisions? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I think all I, I can comment on just sort of my understanding, which is the CDC, you know, AKIP provides the, the recommendations. Many states follow them. Um, but, but after that, it's left up to the state governments, the state public health agencies to figure out. Um, so I can, I, I found a nice link actually, uh, I'll put it in chat from basically Kaiser who accumulated all the links from each state about how they're handling vaccine distribution. And so you can go and, and look, I haven't sort of synthesized all of that to understand what the key differences are, but, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's I'm sure question. population is an obvious one that goes into it, but. I wonder if they're taking case uh, incidents into account or other other such things or or demographics. I'm, I assume they take that into account as well. So it's now speaking of demographics, so the the recent sort of I know it's a, it's a little bit of a fight on Twitter that related to who, how we do prioritization. And if you do if you just do data analysis on on, on data from hospitals it's very clear that age is the is the best predictor of, of risk of dying and even even of, of getting severe cases I mean it's not even close right I, that's why that I've seen yeah. and then you, you have other 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 uh, pre pre-existing conditions that have a little bit of a I mean I think being being male is is about as big as some of the other pre-existing conditions when you do like you know some general linear model or something on the data so but now we're seeing when some of the recommendations we're seeing that there's other considerations being taken into account. Like if you're a front, what is it that they call it? An essential worker. So essential mm -hmm. workers are more exposed. So they should also be get it uh, early. And I think in some places I might've put them ahead of certain age groups. So that might've been what caused uh, the, the controversy. So what is it, what goes into those calculations? You know, I mean, I, I get that essential workers will are more exposed, but at the same time, they tend to be younger. So they don't, even if they do get it, it won't, it won't hurt them as much as if an 80 year old gets it. So do you know what, what goes into those decisions and how much it's based on data, how much is based on ethics and other, other non-scientific yeah. considerations? Right. So, I mean, ACIP just met yesterday and put out, you know, sort of the rationale for why they're recommending the, the tiers that they are. And the big thing that they say is there's basically a balance between controlling morbidity and mortality and trying to have a functioning society, essentially. I see. You know, and, and, and so that's really where they're drawing the line. And they do a good job sort of addressing concerns about equity as well and, and how they're prioritizing guidelines. 
Um, so I can I can link that as well in, in chat. Uh, and I, there's probably recordings of it as well on on YouTube um, of, of the the panel celebrations. All right, great. Well, those are all the questions I have. And um, if you want to uh, say a few words, parting words to all the data scientists that are listening, there are several people that work in clinical trials that are probably very happy to, to see their, their field, you know, being given some, so much prominence. But no, it's good. I, I think it's a good moment to, to talk to other data scientists about all the statistical knowledge that has come out of of running these of running clinical trials and not just statistical also computational logistics it's, it's like it's almost like clinic people running clinical trials were doing data science from early on because there's all, so much more than just data uh, analysis there's all the logistics and knowing to talk to people so i, I want to hear for the as the parting words some of your thoughts on on that that idea on sort of the role of statistics and data science and this yeah, whole like uh, what, like what can we, what can other fields in data science, science learn from from clinical trials statisticians and people who work in clinical trials? Because you have a lot of experience on solving real world problems with data, right? That's yeah, a lot yeah. of people define as data science. Right, right. I, well, I mean, I think of course it's like the the tired old statisticians adage, right? The study design matters, right? And and you know, there's there's no replacing the fanciest machine learning model for a well-designed study. And I think, you know, that that's sort of what we need to, to generate the highest level of scientific evidence of still well-designed scientific studies. And there's no way, you know, that in the absence of randomized trials, we'd be able to establish this level of evidence for, for some of these products. And that said, what's the next wave, right, going to be? Because we have highly effective vaccines now. We're basically running out of time to do any sort of randomized trial, placebo controlled trial of these mm -hmm. products. So there is gonna be a place, right? For how do we do rigorous science using observational data, using EHR to answer the questions that are still out there, right? About how well these vaccines work against transmissibility, how durable are they? You know, there's still gonna be a lot of a lot of questions and a lot of need for rigorous statistics, but that, that are gonna to have to be addressed using non-traditional uh, designs. So a lot of work to do. I think that the really the statistical work on this is doors are just opening. So many doors are just opening. So, um, yeah, uh, I'd say be careful how much you're getting involved in COVID research because it's crazy, <laughs> you know. Uh, but but it's it's very exciting that that I think statisticians and data science has contributed so much to kind of the general discourse around this pandemic. Great. All right. Well, thanks again for taking the time to talk to us. It was very enlightening, very informative. This will this video will be up on YouTube soon so others can can listen and learn. And you'll, you know, have uh, we'll be glad to have you share it with your uh, new Twitter followings. That's right. <laughs> All right, thanks again, David. All right, thanks. Take care. Bye bye.